then you uh, can have the time, whatever you have prepared, and uh, leave a little bit of time for questions uh, if that helps. So in the room we have... Hi, my name is David Phillips. Um, at Airline, I'm a uh, Sunday school teacher for young adults. And, and as a career, I'm a general manager of an international paper um, production facility. My name is Roger Machen. Um, I'm a deacon here at Airline Baptist. I retired from the natural gas industry for 42 years. So my name is Lynn Allen, and I'm the family minister here at Airline Baptist. And uh, Lamar has joined us from online, and he's one of our deacon men in our church and uh, kind of a partner sometimes to Roger on uh, uh, doing some church visitation and evangelism. Very good. So I was telling them a little bit about you and your ministry and um, told them I kind of sent you kind of an outline of where we are. I'm in the process, uh, and a few of these have helped me contact some ministries. You gave me some of those names, uh, kind of finding some best practices that they're doing in uh, their sports program. Uh, obviously, um, many people have uh, the, the facility and the programming, uh, but listening to how they're doing the evangelism part uh, seems to be the focus of our team. Uh, we're calling this a evangelism, a sports evangelism strategy team, and their uh, ultimate goal will help me uh, and the church with our strategy we hope to implement uh, maybe by the spring, uh, related to being intentional in evangelism. So I want to give you the maximum time and uh, whatever you have uh, prepared. Well, I know you asked me to share just a little bit about my background. And um, I will start by saying, if you've seen the, the movie, The Jesus Revolution, that's when I came to Christ. Uh, I was a street kid came up off the inner city streets and I didn't really want anything to do with anything religious. And all of a sudden as a teenager, these freaky people started showing up and they were talking about Jesus and they were singing songs and passing out tracks. And I was like, wow, this is different. And so if you've seen that, that movie, that was the era but there was something that happened then, and having come to Christ through that, I, I began to get right into it, and every different night of the week, I was at a different coffee house. One of them that you might even know about would be the one that was in Kent, Ohio, and I was there during that Kent State riot a few decades ago. And that was the era. But what I began to realize was that we would go to these places and we would kind of get high on the music and they would give you a lot of tracks and a lot of so-called ammunition. And you would go out to the streets, out to the parks, out to the playgrounds, out to the malls. And what I began to realize was that telling people that they were going to hell if they didn't accept Jesus was probably sending more people away from faith in the church than attracting them in. And so I began a personal journey of saying, I like the enthusiasm. I believe in the message, but I don't necessarily think that what we're, how we're giving that message out to be very effective. And I began to search and find out that it really needed to come through relationships and that if, as I formed friendships and relationships with people, they were willing to listen. I had to be willing to listen rather than to have a finger wagging at them. But I had to listen, but they were also then willing to listen. And it was through the relationships then that I, I began to see the Great Commission actually take place. <laughs> And what I recognize in that whole Jesus people movement of that era 
was that they were strong on enthusiasm, but really weak on theology, and particularly a few theologies that are parts of an overall theology. And so to start with, they were weak on ecclesiology, meaning what do we believe about church? And the fact that God had orchestrated and purposed that the Great Commission would go out through the church, through the universal church, through its local congregations. And then the soteriology part of theology. What does it mean to get somebody saved? What does it mean to help somebody come to faith in Jesus? And that it wasn't just what we say now is to count converts, meaning how many people raised their hands or how many people prayed a prayer, how many people signed a form one night. But that in terms of soteriology, it's making disciples, not just counting converts, but really convincing the confused, confix, convincing the conflicted, and, and that that is where we began to understand the term evangelistic disciple-making. So evangelistic that you go, and you, and you do all that part of the Great Commission, but the disciple-making evangelistic disciple making and when you think about the great commission most people in the christian world they get only the first of four things go just go 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 we were going every night every every week out to the parks again we were going but we weren't really effective in in reaching people for jesus reaching those who were far from jesus in the church and so when the evangelistic part to go in the Great Commission, we get it, but then it says what? Okay, it says to make disciples. Well, how do we do that? The third part is baptizing. And then the fourth part is what? To teach them all I've commanded. I have a friend who started to study this for his doctorate, and the last count was that there were 50 commands that Jesus has had given. If that's the criteria for making a disciple, I've not discipled anyone. I'm hopefully I get six or ten of them, and etc. You see what I'm saying here. But the Great Commission is about going, and the way that you make disciples is to call them to faith, have them get baptized, and then teach them all that I commanded. So when I began to go through this in a personal journey, I began to realize, how can I form those relationships with people over a long period of time? Because it doesn't happen overnight. And research indicates that for the totally secularized, totally secularized, non-churched, non-believer, takes six to seven years for them to come to faith in Christ. What does that say about our evangelism that is at best one week of a crusade and often just one day and even one hour of that one day? Well, unless there was a whole lot of other work being done for those previous five, six, seven years, we're probably not going to see much result out of our current methodologies. And so I began to recognize and began to wrestle with How can I develop these long-term, week after week, encounter after encounter with people? And I began to realize that the two ways would be music or sport. I get one Bible verse very well. I'm very gifted at that. And that is to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And so when it comes to music, that wasn't me. You'll have to take this by faith now, but I was a three-sport letterman in high school. I played just a, sh- a short time in collegiate sports and became a high school and college coach. And so for me, the sport part of that was really what began to happen. And as I began to play on teams and invite my friends, my my non-Christian friends, and having repeated time with them, 
that's when I saw the movement towards Jesus and towards the church. I, I had, as, as you can imagine, I had a fairly negative opinion about the church because if the church, this was pre-Christian and somewhat in my Christian early years, because if the church wanted to reach somebody who was far from Jesus, if they didn't really know how, the church didn't really know how to do that well. What the church could do was a whole lot of Sunday school and youth group and Bible studies and things that could help that discipleship part of it, but really getting that person who was six or seven years away from faith in Christ, they couldn't do that. And I got disillusioned with the church, and I went to the paraministry world, and and I started working with the, in the YMCA and Young Life, being a street kid. I was an urban guy, and I went right to the urban communities and started to work in those urban YMCAs and 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 with Young Life. And we started to use sport, and we would have 200, 300 inner city kids coming to these small little places that had like maybe middle school size gymnasiums. They were coming to play ball. You can imagine what a nightmare that was. 200 kids showing up, but we began then to talk to them about Jesus. And there are people that were there that tomorrow morning I will have a Bible study with that came to Christ through that. But what I began to realize is that the paraministry also had a problem. They had a great methodology to reach those people, but they couldn't take them to full discipleship. And so in my personal journey, I said, how can we do all of this together? And that's then when I went. To, so I, I did that for 15 years or so. And my next 15 years, I was at a local church that had a gymnasium, a small gymnasium, and one racquetball court. And we started to do this. When I went there, the church was about 250 people. 15 years later, we had 2,500. We had 40 acres of land, multiple outdoor fields, multiple gymnasiums. It wasn't just me. There was a team of people that believed in this, and we began to work together, and it took all parts of the church. It took the children's ministry, the youth ministry, the young adult ministry, the men's ministry, the women's ministry. It took all of these ministries coming together in the local church to then empower the people who were members and attenders of that church, that congregation, to reach out to their people that they were positioned to reach, their neighbors, their co-workers, fellow students, family members, all of these people that they were positioned to reach, we then were able to mobilize them to not only have the passion, but also provided them with the activity that those people they were positioned to reach would be willing to accept that invitation. Those people that they were positioned to reach, they didn't think they needed worship. They didn't think they needed Bible study. They didn't think they needed anything that the church traditionally had. But a fitness class, a basketball league, a bicycle club, a camping ministry. Yeah, I'll show up for that. Oh, and, and you talk about God here? And what began to happen was that suddenly people that had no way, the, the, the common person sitting in a pew on a Lord's Day morning or evening that had no way to invite their neighborhood to come or their friend or, or co-worker, they didn't have any way to do that. Now they did. Come and play in this golf league with me. Come and join this bowling league. Come to this open gym. Come to this art class. All of these things that began to happen 
And the first year, there may have been a few people that professed faith in Christ, but by year four, five, six, seven, multiple people coming. And then they were even some ways, in some ways more, those people who were just reached, they were more positioned to reach other people. Let me tell you this story. One of the teams played in a softball league. And in order to play on this on this team, you had to have a professed faith in Jesus. You had to be willing to play a couple times a week. You should probably be a pretty good athlete. And we went and played in the open league. And then after we played these other teams a second and third time, we would invite them to join us afterwards for beer, hires, root beer. And through that, all of our men were trained about how to start to reach out. And one of the best ways is, hey, do you play basketball? Do you play volleyball? Do you play, we have these sports. Would you like to come and, and play there? There was one particular man. No, I don't play that. I don't play that. And I don't play that. I play softball and I play ice hockey. Well, we didn't have ice hockey at that time. And we said, well, would you ever want to come and play? Oh, he said, no, no, there's no way that I'm ever going to play for a church. Just get that out of your mindset. That was towards the end of one summer. The next spring, I'm playing on a softball field. I'm playing second base. And right in the middle of this pregame scrimmage, preseason scrimmage, a van pulls up. A minivan pulls up, the run, the engine's still running. He jumps out of it. He runs right across the field to me, right in the middle of the game. And he says to me, you, you told me if I ever needed a place to play uh, softball, I should play for you guys. My team disbanded. I want to play for you guys. This is a guy that would never play for a church. I can hardly even remember this guy. And I said, well, wait till the half inning and I'll come and talk to you. And he said, I want to play on that team that you guys played because, you know, you're pretty good. So I'm going through it. You have to be a believer in Christ. He wasn't. You have to go to the church all the time. You have to be willing to play. Okay. He'd be, and he was a pretty good athlete. He had a few home runs against us. So I go back to our team and I say, we are allowed 16 guys on a roster. We only have 15. What do you think? And they said, let's take them. Long story short, he played with us all summer. He said, I will bow my head when you do that little thing at the end. We did our devotions and prayer. But don't ever ask me to do that. And if I have to go to church, I'm not playing. No problem. At the end of that summer, we played in the state softball tournament. And unfortunately, we finished third and, and got eliminated a game earlier than we would hope to to. We did win it the next two years, but that year we finished third in the state. But they, we lost, I believe, because now we sat around and some of the guys started getting on him and say, how come you won't come to our Bible study? Okay, don't come Sunday morning, but how come you won't come? All these other people on the team, their wives. And, and he said, well, I think I will. You can see where this is going. And I won't bore you with your details. I could tell you at another time. But his wife was then asked later that year and said, what's going on here? And she was raised Mormon. He was raised, if anything, Catholic. And she said, I can't tell you what's going on, but I know it's really good. When he came to Christ, everything changed. The next year, we had 15 guys. We couldn't get that 16th guy. One of the Bible studies that he came to was reflective of the pastor's sermons. We always 
talk about the pastor's sermons and how it applied to our lives. And a pastor preached out of Luke about the unlikely man, the something other man, and the impossible man for Jesus to reach. And the question was that night, who do you know that's impossible for God to reach? I'm sorry, I still get tears in my eyes because Frank said, I'm the impossible man. And one of the other guys said to him, why are you here? He said, because you guys got something that I don't have. I don't have it, but I need it. And then some one of the women asked his wife and said, is he impossible? Oh, she said, you have no idea. <laughs> so now we need one more guy. Now Frank's a believer. He's one of the in guys. He said, you remember that night when I told you I was the impossible man for Jesus to reach? You haven't met my brother yet. <laughs> Leo joined the team that year. You see how this works? This is how it works. And so this is where full circle for me that I just said, Lord, I want to, I want to be part of helping people empower their people in their congregations to go do this. And therefore, that's missiology. We start with ecclesiology, we go to soteriology, but it's missiology. How do we actually go do this? And how is it actually strategically relevant and efficiently effective? Let me wrap that up and then I'll I'll turn it back over to you pastor and we can ask some questions strategic is sport it's not the only strategy you, again you can use music or other things but it's pretty pretty up there in terms of being if not the best it is one of the best strategies but relevant I live in Canton Ohio what sport do you think is relevant there and if you go to New Zealand, you don't play American football. You play what? Rugby. Mm -hmm. Or you get involved in the sailing. That's what's not only strategic, but relevant. And when you're, if you're talking about a, a community <clears throat> from Pakistan or India, you better do cricket. That's not a bug. It's a sport. Mm -hmm. And and you've got to figure out what is relevant within a culture. It may be in where you're at a particular sport or a particular demographic within a particular sport. And then after you figure out what's strategic and relevant, efficiency is so important. Because you've got a limited amount your congregation has a limited amount of resources, facility-wise, equipment-wise, people-wise, finance-wise. And so you've got to try to identify what is the most efficient use of all your resources. And all of that together then makes it effective. Because ultimately, if it's not effective and we are not actually reaching those people who are far from Jesus and his church, it doesn't matter if it's efficient. It doesn't matter if it's strategic or relevant. We got to keep asking those kinds of questions. So that's what we believe we can help your congregation figure out is how to empower your people to be able to reach those people who are far from Jesus using this methodology. What questions or what things can we, where can we go from here? I'll turn it over and see if anybody has an initial question. Anything coming to mind? Is your, is your um, sports ministry, the way you sound is more like this for a older adult people 
But do you have one that's like for kids too? That you start with little kids and work up, or what I gather from what you've been saying, well, like softball men and men's group, is it you're mostly adults? It it is currently uh, cradle to grave in terms of the demographics of ages. Um, but it started the church that church has actually uh, been doing something along this line where they'll celebrate their 80th year in the not too distant future but it started as a youth ministry they started with kids playing basketball because they had a very small gymnasium so that was efficient for them it wasn't so efficient for the adults, although the adults kind of played there for a while. And then from there, it just grew and grew and grew through the decades to where they actually, they do now have an ice hockey ministry there. Uh, it, it just, what what is needed, you have to continue to evaluate. And sometimes uh, and you ask about that particular church, but there are lots of churches that are doing lots of different things around the world. And that particular church has laid down a few things that would, had not, no longer was effective at the same level. So you always you always have to re reinvent it by staying in touch with the community and what does the community need. We... Um, we, we encourage churches to do this, to draw a map. A map tells you where you are, where you came from, how you got there, and gives you the possibilities of where you can go. And are we going the scenic route or the highway? How do we, how do we go where we're being called to go? And you draw that map from two main places. One is that you research your community and you research the community of what what are the leisure pursuits of that community and don't think just sport but all kinds of leisure pursuits although sport would be a, a major part of it and then after you look at what the community is offering and what it doesn't offer then you come back to your own congregation and you say what do we have that would maybe mirror what is needed? Let me give you a couple of just specific examples. If the, con if, if the community does a lot of youth sports and they, youth are all over the community doing it, typically, that youth sport is done in a season. So don't think just because the youth in your community are already playing soccer, baseball, basketball, volleyball, rugby, whatever, that you shouldn't do it. But if they've already brought the crowd, if the community's already brought the crowd, why not in the off on that community's off season, you do the very same sports because there's a whole lot of kids and families that are going to want to already, they want to continue doing that sport. Or they're doing youth sports and they call it coaching, but it is either A, babysitting, or B, child abuse. Do your sport, that, that youth sport, that it is getting them better at their sport, and it's not just babysitting, but it's not abusing the kids. It's really nurturing them. So just because it's already being done doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't do it. In fact, it's probably an indication that we should do it, but we've got to do it when and better than the other people are doing it. And that would be true for whether it's children or adults or senior adults, or young adults, singles. Uh, a great singles thing going right now is Ultimate Frisbee. 
and even some lacrosse and rugby. Great things for senior adults. The biggest, biggest trend right now is pickleball. That wasn't the case 10 years ago. This is how churches need to, to morph and, and to continue to, to change where they're going. That's a great question, but it's all ages. But you need to start with one thing, do it well, and then grow from there. That was going to be my question. Should we cast a wide net and have a foot in every adventure going on in the area, or should we focus on a select few and, like you said, do them as well? I think you just answered that question. Um, what if what if we want to? What if something's big? And we want to be in that arena, but we don't have the expertise within the church. Is it better? And but we want to do it with excellence. Should. Is it possible or feasible to find an expert as a coach and we pair them up with somebody that can do the devotionals, do the discipleship, or should we find a discipleship person and teach them the sport as quickly as we can? All right. That's a great question. Very astute. Let's keep in mind our ultimate goal, a disciple a lifelong, growing, dedicated disciple. There are what we call two disconnects, D-Y-S, think dysfunctional. The disconnects are that there are people in our community, on the streets, whatever, and here's the church over here. The first disconnect that we got to get them over is from being on the, in the community in the street into our sports community, into our leisure pursuit community. That's the first disconnect we have to have. If we don't have something that our people sitting in the pews can invite their folks to, or at some point just putting flyers out and once you get it moving, there's a lot of ways that you can begin to advertise, market, et cetera. And in fact, one of the major marketing avenues today is we don't even go after them. They come after us. We just have to be there online for them to check it out. And we have to have a constant having our search engines, our, 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 all the SEOs have to be constantly updated every at least year, if not every few months, so that the people that are trying to find what we do they are finding us if we give them that technological hook to find us, find out. But we'll get to that at some point. But initially, it's got to be the person on a Lord's Day morning that is bringing their people into that sports community, that fitness community, that recreation community. So... We need to gear to the question is, do we do all things or what do we do? That's why we research our congregation. What are the leisure pursuits of our people in our congregation? And if we find out one particular church, they had over 50 basketball coaches in that congregation. Well, that's a pretty good indication. They also had the person who organized all of the official for the Atlanta Olympics, don't you ever call it ping pong because it's table tennis. Mm -hmm. And that, that woman organized all of those people in Atlanta. And another woman was in the top 10 money winner within the women's pro bowling tour. Until they did the research of their church, they didn't know they had these people. And that helped start a couple of ministries there. So you get who your people are, design your sports rec and fitness around the leisure pursuits of your people, and then they're bringing their people across the first disconnect. But then even more importantly, or at least equally importantly, is that because of that relationship, they can also transport them over to the body life of the congregation, into the Bible studies, into the worship services into all of that that goes on 
And you're not just sending people, you're bringing people, you're taking people with you. And so this is why we've got to think about what are our, what's our church's resources and how does that match up with what the community needs to get people over the first disconnect and over the second disconnect. Did I answer your question? Is, is, am, am I, are you tracking? So in a, in a practical way, um, the project that I've done is I've read your books and, you know, the philosophical as well as the spiritual. So walking through your ecclesiology, soteriology, missiology, but the, the ultimate goal of this group, well, yes, and we have a sports ministry, but now to answer some of these practical um, best practices. So when we've got the crowd coming, uh, I'm hearing, okay, be ready for the marathon, six to seven years, but are there five to 10, maybe there's three of these, uh, you've used a couple of different words, you know, the, the transport, how do we bridge them into the church? So we've limited, you know, some of our questioning to the resources. Uh, and so here's a practical deal. We, we've started a soccer ministry. Uh, soccer is big in the community, but not necessarily in the church. So we sought some coaches that are soccer. They're interested in soccer. They love it. We've got a successful uh, attendance in sports. Uh, so the plane's up in the air, if you will. But our people, they like football and baseball. You know, the churchgoers are talking about football and baseball, but uh, it's stereotype. It seems to be the lost community. We get a lot more bites on the lostness in this soccer world because they're not connected to church per se. Some of it's uh, cultural. You know, we got several Hispanics. Uh, we've got Islam uh, because in the worlds that they're coming from, that's the major sport. So the question related to uh, I can get a coach that knows soccer and trying to train them to be better at the sport because that that guy you're kind of talking about, he want to be a part of a competitive team, you know, somebody that's going to where he can play. But then by your lifestyle, obviously, he started asking questions and got a non-threatening inside track. So we're, we're uh, entertaining the concepts. Do we use our church people who are good at loving kids, teaching a Bible study? Can those be partnered together so far in a non-traditional way? Um, many people know upward, but the, 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 to me, the stress oftentimes is I got to find somebody who can coach basketball and give a Bible study. Uh, so we've been kind of entertaining. Hey, I've got people that can give a Bible study or an object lesson. Could they be brought into the end of a practice uh, and, and do that in a, a, a kind of a marriage kind of thing? So do you or have you experienced some of these connecting points and sharing evangelism, the gospel in the sporting environment uh, and then also bridging it? Is there some practical things you could maybe speak to that coaches versus church people, you know, doing an evangelism project. Well, first of all, it, it's not lost on me. And I hope uh, all of your deacons and, and folks sitting around the table here. Now you understand the malady that your pastor has experienced. If he's, if he's actually read these books, uh, <laughs> we do need to get him some counseling. Um <laughs> But, but at any rate, um, to, to get to piggyback on a couple of these things uh, that, that I'm hearing, you're, you're, you're now starting to say, how do we make this practical, which is the right, which is the right questions? Um, you, there's, there's a dynamic that has occurred in America, the last generation, so the last 40 years or so. And this, this trend and dynamic within the Christian church is now impacting how people do their sports and rec and fitness outreach. Up until the 
40 years ago, almost every kid had some Bible knowledge. And what we began to recognize about 20, 15 to 20 years ago is that when you had a coach from your church, they were already pretty well steeped in Bible knowledge and they, they could do that. And what we have recognized now is that you're almost afraid to allow some of these people to actually do the Bible part of it because they, uh, they have bought into new age stuff. They bought into uh, all kinds of stuff that they are not biblically sound. They're Christians. They're starting that journey of Bible study, but boy, to let them loose, it, it, it can be a problem. And so we we have to we have to recognize where we're at. And and so there are some different methodologies that can help us with this. One of them is what we would call a master teaching. And that is that you have your people who are fluent in coaching, fluent in a particular sport, but we don't want to let them loose theologically yet. But once they hear it, they can mirror it, they can, rest they can restate it. And so a number of churches have gone to a master teacher that gives the devotional, gives the Bible teaching during that part of the experience and may be a coach in the league, hopefully is a coach in the league, but that they then provide for the other coaches the kinds of things that they can say about a particular topic. And what we're recommending is that congregations like yours would work together with your children's, your youth, and your adult ministries and that if you're going to be studying through the book of John in your sermons or your adult Bible studies or whatever curriculum your youth, your children are going through, that it all get lined up and you align it. And then that is also part, that's what is being taught in the, the sports part of it as well. And that way, people are getting it everywhere. It's being reinforced, and it, it, it empowers your coaches to be able, because they're getting it in Sunday school class, they're getting it from the sermon, they're getting it from their men's or women's Bible study, they can then pass that on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one little wrinkle into this, and that is we don't call them coaches. We don't call them volunteers. We call them missionaries. We call them local missionaries. The reason is, is yes, they have to coach. But if they coach, they think, as long as I've made the lineup and strategized how to win the game, I've done what I'm supposed to do. But if I'm a missionary, then what I'm being asked to do is reach people who are far from Jesus. And I'm on mission. So, yeah, we can call them a missionary coach, a local missionary coach. But I think you understand what I'm saying. So I'm just kind of throwing that in extra. But yes, um, and and th this combined with the previous question, um, and, and that was about, can we get coaches that are coaches that are their expertise? Yes. But when I went on that monologue about over the two disconnects, unless that coach is relationally connected with those people, it's harder for them to bring them into the sports community and then into the body life of the church. 
That's why we want to empower local missionary coaches to be those people. And we've got to we've got to take some time to train and give them the experience of how to do the spiritual side of it, even if they have never done it before. Again, am I answering questions? Are are we yeah. tracking? Yeah, for me. I have a question. So if we, if you're wanting to share this vision of you're not just a coach, you're not just filling this position, that you're you're being a missionary in your community, how do you cast that vision? Because, you know, people are quick to sign up to go overseas or somewhere to do a mission trip, but they're not always quick to sign up to volunteer in their church. What Do you have some advice of how you cast the vision of, you know, um, that we're being called to serve in the mission field here in our local church? Very good question, Lynn. And we we start with all are to go and we are to go to all. And that evangelistic disciple making is not the pastor's role. Evangelistic disciple making is the person who attends this church as a member of this church that's their role and the pastoral staff is to empower and enable people to be the evangelistic disciple makers and so I, there's there's just no easy way to do this but it's got to be repeated and constantly upfront it's got to be one of the, the congregation's core values that all are to go, not just somebody who's paid to do it. All are to go, and we're to go to all. And um, so I, if I heard your question right, um, we've got to help people understand that they are called. But then that can be kind of overwhelming, and we have to make the transition to say missions are you go overseas that's why we're calling you local missionaries that's why we're calling you missionary coaches because we're all to be on mission but mission is not going missio where missions is the the, the greek word that it comes from is someone who is sent now, of course, they need to go. But I think the differentiation there is very important. And some people say, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to be a missionary. Okay, but you need to be sent. And that's where the congregation comes in of giving people the training and the encouragement and the empowerment to be able to go because they are being sent. Being sent encompasses prayer. It's being sent encompasses training. Being sent means that I'm encouraging, I'm modeling, I'm I'm doing it with you. Mission is being sent, and it encompasses all those things. So, Lynn, come back to me if you have more there. Did, did I answer? Are are we all right? Or you yes, want to go another great. level? That's great. So I I would follow up on that. So we've trained our our churches to do mission projects. Usually it's collecting a thing, doing a thing uh, to support some missionaries. So if we're trying to bridge what can organically happen for me, finding people I can have the sports talk with and not lose sight of needing to connect them to the church, uh, I'm thinking of about 12 or 15 sweet 60 plus year old ladies that I can say, Hey, could you put some Christmas bags together? And we're going to give all these kids a, a Christmas party. There, many of them are affluent. They don't need a present. They don't, you know, but we would do that in El Salvador, but it would mobilize the people in the church to do a gift. And it's one more opportunity to present the gospel or the latest, you know, thing that we've been teaching in children. Can you, could you see that in an existing church as being one of those maybe practical things we could do to bridge a gap? 
I'm going to make sure I understood the question. Are are you asking if there are other roles other than coaching that people from the congregation can get involved in? Yeah, that's what I'm not seeing in the, the group. So a lot of sports are separate than their churches. And over time, obviously, they're hoping to build relationships, but it's happening between professional staff. Um, if they are recruiting, to your point, and I think um, – uh, we heard a lot from um, uh, other communicators. Uh, Rob Burns, you know, he he talked about training the coaches. Uh, but if you need ten teams and three are awesome Christians, but seven aren't, they're not going to get that gospel conversation at the end. So I can get mobilize more people who want to tell people about Jesus. They just can't do it through sports, but they could make a you know a, a gift, bring it out there, see it happen. But then you kind of put your person of influence that knows the sports to do kind of that gospel message. But it's a partner between the church, if that makes sense. Trying to connect them. Yeah, and by the way, Rob Birds may be the greatest evangelist outside of Billy Graham that I've ever met. Wow. Rob is a wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, Yes, I think all of that is possible. And not everybody has a gift of athletics or coaching sports. And so one, one of the, the, the great things that can happen, and, and we just call them the barbecue bubbas. And and there's a bunch of guys that they they don't know how to swing a bat or shoot a ball, but they know how to grill. And if you can, most of these things are that they're seasonal. And at the end of the season, you have some sort of big bash that you invite parents to, or you invite spouses to. And, and if those barbecue bubbas can cook up a feast and they, they couldn't kick a ball anywhere <laughs> that they, they can help. And, and so whatever gifts people can make, what, However, they can come. Uh, hopefully, one of the ways, and I know budgeting is part of your your questions, and I'd, I'd like to address some of that as well. But one of the ways you can augment your your finances is to to do a really good snack bar, and and that you have whether they're barbecue bubbas or they're you know somebody who can cook up those coney dogs on a Saturday and and get that food out there. And people are purchasing it there while they're watching their kids play or the the tournaments going on. Um, there are many roles that people can play, and we just have to be able to creatively figure out how to engage all gifts and all passions. But there's one thing that everybody is commissioned to do, and that is pray. Mm -hmm. And Pray specifically. Pray. Have have the sewing circle that's knitting the the quilts. Have them give them the names, and particularly for youth, but maybe in all cases, just first name for some privacy issues concerns, but first names on whatever team, whether it's the red team or whether it's, you know, you, whatever nickname the team has. And, and that's who that woman, while she's putting the needles and thread that she's praying for those people. And that woman's praying for another one or however you do that at a men's Bible study, we're praying for this league, men, before we eat our food here at this breakfast, we're going to pray for these people. That's part of our role. And so engaging everybody at some level is really important. I think that's really, really important. I have a question about branding and marketing. You mentioned SEO optimization. Would it be beneficial to have, to give our league or our, our sports ministry a name that can go by and maybe have a separate website that's not a subdomain of our current church website 
that way it kind of can have a life of its own and build a reputation? Or is it better to have it affiliated with the church website so they know that this is this church's ministry? Absolutely. There's a lot of levels to marketing, but what you're talking about is very important. And people sometimes shy away from that because they feel that, that, that it's a separate website, that sometimes they feel like, well, we're not being truthful. You know what? Make the, the SEO optimization there, make that sport, but then you'll always have to be honest and upfront. There has to be some place on that when they land there that they realize that it is a church. Mm -hmm. You, you want to be as forthright and honest about it, but you don't lead with it. You allow it to be there. You lead with what the people are searching for. They're searching for sport. And what are your distinctives? What, what are your testimonies that, that, People will say, you got to go there because of this. And having a video of a satisfied parent or a satisfied participant, having a, um, one of the things that, you, you, this may, may surprise a lot of people, but one of the things that would attract a lot of families is to know we don't do our youth sports on Sundays. We believe that that's a day for family and church and things. And we're going to we're going to keep you busy 6 days of the week, but that's the day that you can rest and be with your family. Whatever your value system is, whatever is your highlight, um what is what makes you different and better than anybody else? And then of course, that's all part of that that search engine that you want to be there with. But it all really is going to come down at some point to word of mouth. Because even if they come through that search engine and they get there, if they're not happy once they get there, they're, they're not going to stay. And that word of mouth is going to destroy you long term. And oftentimes, once they find it's a church, they're going to ask their friends. They're going to ask somebody, hey, what do you know about this? So word of mouth is really important. Oh my gosh, our kids got better. I'll tell you what, I played in it. It was outstanding. That's the kind of stuff that you, you've got to have in addition to the technology. Again, did I answer the question? Anything else? I get carried away sometimes and I wonder sometimes if I actually answer the question, so. Well, I wanted to be mindful of your time. I have eight our time, so it's nine your time. So I wanted to give you an hour. Uh, and and uh, now you've given us two hours because you waited for an hour. But is there any follow-up question you think of? If we do, uh, of course, I'll email you. Um, I, I can easily see in the future having you come and uh, or at least video talking to you know our volunteers, talking to a mission team just to you know give a message. I see that happening with bringing in experts and saying, hey, could you give us 30 minute video? You could pre-record or do it live like we're doing it, but just, you know, pouring into people because I think that's a part we're going to have to really work on is, is casting that vision. And then the next three to five years, you start developing those people who love that sport uh, they fell in love with Jesus. And so now they're double whammy, right? Every time they're out there, they're going to be sharing the love of Christ, but they're bringing that excellence in sport. I want that guy as my coach because they win. And man, my kids learn about Christ or it's positive or, you know, whatever. So I uh, sure appreciate your time. Well, you did ask about budgeting. Let me just give you a quick okay. thumbnail sketch of that. Okay. There's three, there's three main models. One is what we call the country club model. The second is the congregationally congregational mission model, and the other is the combo model. The the country club is that you everybody that comes in pays for everything. They they pay the a membership fee, they pay a participation fee, they may even pay a fee to join in, uh, an overall fee, and all of those fees cover 
everything that is done there. The, the congregational mission budget approach is that the congregation pays for everything. Mm -hmm. and, and so we recommend a combination model. And what that would look like is that your congregation pays for anything that is permanent. Facilities, equipment, and permanent staff. That way, a person that's coming in that is far from Jesus and the church isn't saying, oh, they put a new roof on the building. No wonder I had to pay $783 to play in that league, you know? And you want to just eliminate all of that. Mm -hmm. But we also know that if people don't pay something, they don't value it. And they don't keep coming back. Particularly things like in fitness ministry or a league. In fitness ministry, if I have to pay this for this month or this quarter or whatever. And you know what? I'm kind of sore after the first couple of times I went in there. And I don't feel like going back. But I already paid all that money. You kind of get, there's a couple reasons why to charge that money. And that should go then towards all of the temporary, the balls, the officials, if you use officials, the nets, the, the things are going to wear out. Um, these are the things that those fees should pay for. Awards, whatever you're going to do. Uh, if you're going to do a banquet night at the end, it, it should cover those things. And then you can honestly say to them, every penny that you put into this is coming back to you via these ways. Um, so permanent from the church mission budget, temporary from the participant fees. And then because it is mission, try to have money in your mission budget that would cover the costs for someone who cannot afford it. That can be a true mission as well. So just briefly, those things that for budgeting, some ways that you can begin to envision it. And the last thing on the budget is that you've got a couple of your uh, elders sitting around, the, uh, the deacons sitting around the table here and you guys and gals have probably, you give your tithe and then they ask, sacrificially give something for this project or that project or whatever. And then, and then you, they come back and say, we want you to give something more now to the sports ministry. And you're like, Hey, every pocket that I have is empty. It's all gone to the church. Well, you know what? Um, is it is an international paper there, Dave? Yes. Maybe they maybe they have an advertising budget, and suddenly that goes up on the wall. This is sponsored by, or out on the outfield fence, the local grocery store, or the local gas station, and and these are members of your church, and they've given you everything personally. Oh yeah, but I do have an advertising budget. So there's some other creative ways that we can go about raising the funds but time's over i just wanted to throw that in because you had asked me to think about budgets good thank you yeah I, I think you're affirming some of the approaches obviously guys to this point so that's excellent and then this team because from it they're going to pull together and says i think we're on the right track here's where we need to make an adjustment here's where we need to go from here uh, so, uh, again, your time has been so valuable for me, uh, previous conversations, including this one. We're recording this, and so we've got a couple of live on here with us, uh, but then there's probably a, a, at least a, a six more, and then we'll have it for future references so people can kind of track our work. So thank you for your time. Would you do us a favor as we close out? Would you mind praying for uh, this ministry and this project and uh, our time together? Absolutely. Thank you.
Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity. And my prayer, Lord, is focused on the people who today don't know you as their Lord and Savior. I don't know their names in this community. Chances are there are people that are out in this community that even there's not even one person around this Zoom call that knows the name. Mm -hmm. But you do, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray for those people that today are at least nameless to some of us and maybe all of us, but are known to you. And I pray that you would begin to work in those people's lives so that when somebody taps them on the shoulder at work or one neighbor talks to another or a student talks to a fellow student and they say, come and join us, come and join me. I pray, Lord, that you would begin to pray, that you would begin to work in the hearts and minds and lives of those people who are nameless so that when they're invited, that they're ready to say yes. And then, Lord, that you'd continue to work in their lives so that when they come into the sports ministry, this fitness ministry, this recreation ministry, that they would then be able to be open to hearing the gospel yeah. that they've already seen proclaimed in the lives of these people and others. And Lord, that those nameless people now known to the people within this congregation, that you would take them to that very point where they would kneel before you and accept you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that it may even be in a future decade that one of these nameless people today would become the pastor of this church. Mm -hmm. That they would become a missionary mm -hmm. to somewhere in this world. Mm -hmm. Lord, that's our prayer. Mm. We don't pray for a great sports ministry. We pray for people to come to Jesus through the sports rec and fitness. So, Lord, I pray for these people that you would empower them, help them to make good decisions, empower them to do all that they need to do, that you would provide all that they need, financially, resources, people, bring them the coaches, bring them all these things. And also that you would bind up the enemy that would come and try to tear this place apart. Bind up all the demonic forces that would come against this, Lord Jesus, because we know they've entered into a spiritual battle and the enemy is not happy. The enemy will even try to re destroy this recording yeah. because he wants no one to understand how to reach people that they that, that, that those enemies have in their grasp today. So protect this church, empower it, fulfill your calling in this church, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray it in the power of your Holy Spirit and the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Thank you, folks. Thank you so much Thank for you. your time. Great to be with you. Supper's coming to you. There you go. <laughs> Bye-bye.